So I know the last thing you want to hear at 6 o'clock at night is PowerPoints. So I brought a few of them because I want to connect this discussion to uh, some of the research in autonomy that's being done. Uh, because I think for me, there were two really exciting things about U.S. Airways Flight 1549. First and foremost, everybody lived, which was very unexpected given what happened. That was very exciting for everybody, including those people. The second thing, though, was that it was really a perfect example that isn't morbid and politically incorrect of a case where autonomy or automation would have made a difference. Right, so how many of you went to uh, uh, John Langford's presentation? He's from Aurora, it was a few weeks ago. Yeah, so if you did, he talked about this a little bit. And what he was talking about was very similar to what I'll talk about, except it was kind of more abbreviated, which is right now, we don't hear of commercial transport aircraft running out of fuel because we have computers constantly monitoring fuel flow. They're given how much fuel you start out with and how much you should have in reserve when you land, either at your primary airport or an alternate airport, which is kind of a backup that you always have in mind or in the computer's mind. Should something happen to not let you go to your primary airport, like in general weather is the main problem? Um, but the reality is the flight management system that exists today in both Boeing and Airbus planes, those are the two most common manufacturers, of course, of the large jets, are kind of at a, in a what I'll call a, a standstill. There's a lot of good automation that has made flying safer. The routine holding the wings level, the uh, Again, calculating fuel, making sure you're following your flight plan, not getting lost. Those things happen automatically now as long as you supervise them as a pilot or a co-pilot. But these flight management systems are rigid. When things go wrong, generally the automation turns off. And going wrong could range from a sensor failure where suddenly the pilot finds themselves flying but with less data than they had before or some kind of structural or engine or control surface failure that causes the plane to perform very differently than it did before. So in these cases, you have a crew that's been managing, not flying, suddenly have to take over. This is not a good design. It would be a better design to either require the crew to be engaged throughout the flight not just in looking at the instruments and the status of the flight plan, but if they really are going to have to take over, it shouldn't be sudden. It should be gradual, or there should be some kind of mechanism for conveying information about what is happening, as opposed to a sudden autopilot is off, warning messages scrolling across the screen like happens now. Now, I think here in aerospace, we don't focus on human factors so much. We instead focus on the engineering of the vehicle and then its operation in flight. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the interface and what the screens should look like and kind of the cognitive process. But what I will say is that if you look at most of these accidents in commercial aviation, there's a sequence of events that happen. First, something goes wrong. It could be something in the environment, such as bad weather or turbulent atmosphere. And then there's an inappropriate crew response, and this happens over and over again. Something goes wrong, the crew doesn't respond correctly. That doesn't mean that they immediately crash the plane, it means that they don't have the absolute optimal response to the problem. In fact, sometimes they might think it's something a little different than what it is. Sometimes inappropriate crew response is just doing nothing, not realizing that there's a big problem going to come up. And then there's the notion of either loss of control or a failure event happening that causes unavoidable loss of control and then an accident. So in this case, in the Hudson River landing case, I'm going to play this video next just to kind of remind us all of the four minutes. I'm sure you've all seen the movie Sully or you probably wouldn't be here tonight. Um, before I give my opinion, 
Uh, what did you think? Did you think it was accurate? Any comments? Mm -hmm. Pretty sure there were some effects added to the movie for dramatic. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So first of all, um, yeah. The, the conversations, I'm sure, were not exactly as they happened, <coughs> except for the cockpit voice recorder being replayed close to how it was. Uh -huh. It seemed like it took forever for them to realize that they were leaking it out. Yeah, so that is actually, we'll play this. Uh, and I'll I'm not going to spoil my comment on that right now. But yeah, I, I agree with that. It took a long time. Anything else? So uh, my main complaint about the movie, well, I have several, but I liked it overall. And I'm a big Tom Hanks fan, so that works too. But the NTSB was cardboard caricature bad, right? And even Sully was quoted as saying that he was kind of disappointed as to how they were portrayed. I'm sure he didn't enjoy testifying and being grilled in that fashion. But it wasn't, they weren't idiots, and they weren't stupid, and they asked good questions. So I think that was overall the, the, the complaint that was most major. So I'm going to start by kind of reminding us of what happened with this video. And I hope audio works. It's not working right now. There we go. Jet engine noise. I don't know if I can turn up the volume. Hangout thing that shows up there. It's like future automation. See, that's just bad. I got it fifteen point nine. Give me left traffic to runway three one. Unable. Okay, what do you need to win? I don't think this is synchronized with what actually is being shown in the video. <laughs> But yes, I want to go to Teterboro. I'm below the building rooftops. <laughs> They're also staying there and amazingly, you know, ground effect is incredible. Suddenly they can float, literally. Hit the ground already. <laughs> I like that simulation. It makes it seem like it was so gentle, right? Not even a splash. You get like a top score in diving. See, they had some splash there. Eagle 
So I'm not sure the simulation was completely accurate that was on the video, but the cockpit voice recorder was accurate. Um, so what went wrong in the audio? Did the controller do anything wrong? Did Sully, the pilot, do anything wrong? Stop that. He's going like, to type, type solutions to Arrow 201's exam tomorrow if we're not careful. I'm just going to, we'll see what happens here. It's going to come back. Google Hangouts is like that. So um, there were seconds, many seconds that passed between the time that the bird strike was first reported and the time that the people on the ground recognized that there was a problem. Why is this a big deal? Well because there was very little time to actually do anything. Now, for those of you who are pilots, if you're in controlled airspace, especially if you're in crowded departure airspace, um, what could you do that was different? Could Sully have done anything differently? Well, he could have, but he also could have collided with another airplane. Right, so the reason that I'm focusing on air traffic control right now is that even if he had realized that he had the altitude to turn around and go back, there needed to be clearance from air traffic control to do that because the traffic was very likely tightly spaced. There was another guy on the runway either getting ready to take off or already just off the runway, uh, in which case they would be on a collision course. So there are two challenges here in automation. The one I'm going to talk about is the emergency flight planning and the emergency flight management. But the one that actually I think is farther in the future is the data link based communications as the safety critical way of communicating. Voice is slow. Bits are fast. This shouldn't be a surprise. We know that. So why is it that if you look at any model of next gen, they all contain voice-based air traffic control? This is not just a rhetorical question. I'd like to hear your opinions on this. So maybe it's more secure. OK. But what if you had just thinking about it, a satellite link, a cell link, and a Wi-Fi link with three different cryptographic protocols. On a jet like this, having multiple protocols and types of communication is not ridiculous. Right? It's an expensive piece of equipment, and that would not add that much to the price. So I don't think that security is the hugest issue. But it is an issue, and it is often quoted, but I think it's a scapegoat. Because we're not really seriously saying, what would we have to do to get this communication capability safety critical, replacing voice in place? We're speaking of data link, but we're talking about decades between when we have just a few bits of data coming through a data link to give air traffic control better information versus having all of it be data link. What's that? I agree with your idea that if the data link Thank you. So, so I, I prefer arguments because then I get to argue back, but that's it. Thank you. So uh, how do we get there? Well, the reality is that there are a lot of pilots both at the FAA 
and that speak as the experts for the community who have grown up picking up the microphone or wearing the headset and pushing the button to talk. Their world model does not include just being silent and looking at a screen. So what that would mean, even if they could talk to it, right, and it could talk back with voice synthesis to prevent them from using their valuable vision to actually do something to communicate, it would mean that uh, we would change that world model, right? And this is a classic example of how it needs to change because the reality is all that needed to happen is that the data that's already recorded in the black box, things like how much thrust the engine is producing and the health of the systems would have instantly informed not just the pilot but air traffic control of the problem. And when I say instantly, yes, it's not absolutely instantly, but you're talking milliseconds, not a whole conversation where people have to comprehend that, in fact, birds have struck these engines. Because the system knows from its sensors, you know, their engines with advanced computers and thousands of sensors in them that know that thrust is not being produced. That information is available on the airplane and could be available in every air traffic control facility in the area, along with an automatic declaration of emergency, instantly. And so what that would mean is the whole game changes. Now you have all of the aircraft and all of the controllers aware that that plane has priority handling. That plane is now free to not think that it has to somehow watch out for other traffic because the other traffic will be moving out of the way. And there would be no question, no pilot ever would question that this plane had to turn back and do whatever it needed to do, as long as they understood that that's what needed to happen. So that's the main thing that this video shows. There's one other technology advancement that kind of is underappreciated. So if you look at the Airbus aircraft, in the movie they show Sully moving the stick very carefully. What was he doing with that stick? Does anybody know enough about the flight controller to say kind of what was happening when you move the stick of it? He does, right? They, they, they know over there, but they're not involved. I'm talking to you guys. Yeah. Well, uh, so the stick actually, uh, in this case, was operating in a mode where you're actually changing the vertical acceleration when you move it. So it's called NZ law. So what that means is that when you push the stick forward, you're commanding a change in flight path angle effectively as long as you have the stick deflected. And when you pull it back, you're changing for more climb. So it's a climb rate stick. Now the reality is, if you go back to the Cessnas, right, you move the equivalent of the stick, the big wheel, and you're actually physically moving the elevator of the aircraft. So it's a very different thing. In the, in the case of the fly-by-wire aircraft, this direct control law, is, it, it's not direct. It, this autopilot control law is having the, the crew not actually fly with the controls directly. It's having them fly through a flight control law. So now if you look at roll, the same thing is happening. You're looking at roll rate. So if you let go of the stick, the roll rate is zero. If you grab the stick and you deflect it, then you command a non-zero roll rate. So when you're lining up to land, and Sully lined up beautifully, right, straight section of the river, he made it over that bridge, that was kind of a tense moment, I'm sure, for everybody. And then he lined up straight to land. Well, as soon as the wings were level on that aircraft, hands off, he did not fly the wings level down to the ground. The autopilot did, the software did. And the chances that a human fine motor control would have had the, the wings so level to not cartwheel from the wingtip hitting first are almost zero. On the other hand, the chances that an autopilot, once the wings were level and the hands are off, could have the bandwidth and the sensor accuracy to keep the wings level was quite high. So the reason that that plane didn't flip 
is because Sully lined it up with the kind of outer loop commands that he was putting in, and then the autopilot flew the plane in without tipping the wings. That's why it didn't cartwheel. People would have died if it had cartwheeled, almost certainly. Now the other thing, I'm not going to talk just about control for the next one minute, and then I'll go back to it. The plane didn't sink right away. Well, first of all, it was because it wasn't a really hard landing, and so it didn't crack the airframe and make it fall apart, in which case it would definitely have had trouble staying afloat. But Airbus actually, as part of their design, uh, had some waterproofing of the bottom of their fuselage. I don't know that there had been previous airplanes that had that. Uh, and so they just happened to be in the very fortunate situation of being in an airframe where the manufacturer had thought of a water landing being possible. And again, if you had this kind of smooth landing where you didn't crack the structure, it actually didn't fill with water. And my video turned off. So there were all of these things going on where I think if you watch the movie or kind of don't read the details in the report, what you miss from that is that there are a lot of technological advances that caused the situation to be as good as it was. The sensors and the flight controller that allowed the plane to actually come in and not cartwheel and have a relatively smooth landing on water. The waterproofing. And so then the question is, did they have to land on the water? Was that necessary? Now those of you that watched the movie also saw the simulations, right? So the reality is if you had a trained crew sitting in a simulator knowing exactly what was going to happen, then they could have turned back and gone to LaGuardia, right? And they showed that in the simulator. And that was about the same time as the, the NTSB was doing simulations to calculate that as well independently. And uh, you know, I, my group did a few of those calculations as well. But again, between the kind of cognition that something has gone wrong and then communicating that to air traffic control and then having air traffic control not clear the airspace, time passed, too much time passed. So not all emergencies have such brilliant results where everybody lives. I love these videos. Let me recommend them to you. The AOPA organization, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, have these things called uh, Air Safety Institute Accident Case Studies. They're awesome. If you ever fly, you should watch them. Now, don't watch too many of them or you'll never fly again because you'll see a whole bunch of crashes and things going wrong. But the reason to watch them is if you do any sort of research in autonomy, what we find is that the basic kind of flight control and sensing features have been done and they're out there right now. What's missing is handling all of the anomalies, the exceptional events. It are those, it, it's those anomalies that tend to cause crashes. So between the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, accident dockets, if you type that on Google, you'll find a link to all of the data for accidents that have involved the United States airplanes, whether they happened here in the US or abroad, and then any accident from any airline that happens in the United States. And it does not only have the reports, it also has the black box data, all of it. So if you're a data processing buff, freak, whatever you want to call it, analyst, then you can actually download all of the data that was used for the investigation both black box in kind of a spreadsheet format, a CSV format, or uh, the cockpit voice recorder um, audios. And those are a very nice complement to the accident investigation reports because they let you analyze the data potentially differently than the investigators analyzed it. One of the challenges in dealing with trying to mine this data is that um, the black box only records snapshots of data not that often. And as a software person, my biggest disillusionment in all of this black box data processing is there's nothing diagnostic about the software recorded or the networking, right? It's all about the engines and the sensors 
and the pilot commands and status of things, warning lights and things like that would show up as flags. But what happens if the data channel slows down or stops? Well, you see the same number over and over again. But you don't know whether that was because the sensor failed or the communication link failed or the software writing the data to the black box failed. So there, there's some progress to be made there. But um, there, there's a lot to talk about in aviation safety. But let me get back to the uh, US Airways discussion. Once an accident happens, the black box and the cockpit voice recorder tend to be all we have unless people survive. So in the case of US Airways 1549, there was a lot more. They were rescued because they were in New York. If you look at the scenario, we have videos taken from windows. You know, people were like, wow, there's a plane, and they pulled out their phones and took videos of the, the plane going down. There were people waiting to rescue them. They, had, they were in constant contact with air traffic control. Contrast that to some of the accidents that have happened over the oceans, where Maybe we fly, find the black box if we're lucky. Maybe we can't even find the airplane. But in these cases, it's a lot harder to figure out what happened. So uh, this type of accident case study, um, you know, one of the things that's easy to think is, well, maybe, this, maybe these things don't happen. Maybe, maybe engine out is not really a problem to worry about because commercial planes hardly ever have that scenario. What's the chances you're going to hit birds? in both engines. It's actually very small. One of the reasons to look at general aviation videos is they're not triply redundant. Right? Most general aviation airplanes have one or at best two of each type of sensor, of each type of controls, which means that if you have a failure, say of the engine, right, that plane that you see in that little shadowy figure has one engine. That means you're a glider. And airplanes that are intended to fly under propulsion are not really efficient gliders, so they're going to land. How often do you think a general aviation plane makes an emergency landing because they lose thrust? Which could be because of fuel starvation, problem with fuel lines, running out of fuel, bad management, or uh, having a bird strike or some equivalent failure in the engine. Every day? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they, every plane falls out of the sky like in Ann Arbor every day. But if you look worldwide, there are planes that are losing their engines every day. So it's not such an isolated incident. One of the things that uh, um, we tend to ignore as a research organization, I think, in, at least in the United States, and to some extent worldwide, is what's happening in general aviation because it's not popular. Most of us fly on commercial transport, and so we don't think about all of these older airplanes and the challenges in keeping people safe in them. One of the reasons to watch some of these Air Safety Institute videos is that you begin to realize just how many challenges there are. So here's a case, and I'm going to start it right here, where a pilot has been flying for a while and is probably tired, and it's nighttime. We'll never know for certain, but there are a couple of potential explanations. Well, and we'll get it's to It's possible, for example, that the pilot was simply uncomfortable with ILS approaches. Instrument it landing seems system more likely, however, the that the option was simply overlooked. It was dark, the pilot was flying solo in IMC, things were not going well, and fatigue was likely setting in. I love in. these icons. It was a situation ripe for mistakes. It was also a circumstance in which ATC might have been able to help the airport wasn't busy, and the controllers knew the pilot was having trouble with the RNAV approach. Under the circumstances, a simple suggestion to try the ILS might have made a real difference. Whatever the case, by the time November 7-5 Sierra headed back north, having burned an hour of its fuel reserve, the situation had become vastly more serious. So this was bad weather and the pilot can't get into their original airport or the alternate. It's now 6.01 p.m. That's one of the Roughly scariest things Roughly an hour past the pilot's original ETA. And he's just been cleared for the RNAV runway 22 approach at Georgetown, Delaware. I'm here, I got the Georgetown uh, 225 quarter new observation. 
wind is estimated at 1 and 0 at 7. Five miles visibility was missed. Ceiling uh, overcast at 300 feet. Thank you, sir. This one here. The ceiling is 400 feet lower than reported just 10 minutes earlier. It's also slightly below minimums for the approach. But the pilot so opts to proceed anyway. Chart, whereas the other one was a this VFR time he descends chart, 100 feet below minimums. But the end result is the but same. You're not supposed to fly in the clouds. It's over, I got to go around again and send the here. You follow the instruments on board. Let's try that again, please. So I'll tell you, there's now, nothing however, worse than being in an airplane and Fuel. not be able to find it's a runway to land on. PM, four you know hours and 55 minutes into So this guy has been flying too long. I'm running pretty low. How about two? Would that be okay? As the aircraft nears Dover Air Force Base en route to 33 November, the pilot asks a logical question. Ma'am, I don't suppose there's any chance I can uh, land at Dover. Commissioner, the passenger, and the emergency unit, please come here. This is where you declare an emergency. Really? Okay. That's the Pilots don't like that because they have paperwork. But it is an emergency. Ten minutes later, and eight miles north of the base, there's a frantic call from the pilot of 75 Sierra. Ma'am, I'm declaring an emergency here. I'm out of fuel. I am out of fuel and going down. By the time the pilot asked Dover approach about landing at the base, he'd been airborne for five hours. From his flight planning, or failing that, his fuel gauges, he must have known that he had precious little time left. And he still had more than 10 miles to go before commencing a non-precision approach in marginal weather. How could any pilot consider that anything other than an emergency? The most likely explanation, sadly, is that he was ashamed to confess his predicament, and all too aware of the fact that he was talking to a military controller about landing in an Air Force base. Those factors, coupled with the controller's strong, if appropriately qualified, statement about landing at the base, are likely what kept him pushing on in silence, despite the dire situation and ultimately what cost him his life. Ma'am, I'm declaring an emergency here. I'm out of fuel. I am out of fuel and going down. Give me vectors, please. Over the next few minutes, confusion reigns as the approach and tower controllers attempt to vector the stricken aircraft for landing at Dover. I'm out of fuel and going down. Number seven five zero six miles. Keep talking to me, please. Number seven five zero six miles. I'm going down. Number seven five zero. You have the seven six. Negative, negative, negative. I'm still heading in the right direction, 75 Sierra. On course, but out of energy. Shortly thereafter, the aircraft collides with trees two miles off the end of the runway and crashes to an abrupt fatal halt. The crash of November 75 Sierra is something of an enigma. While it's easy to see how a pilot of modest experience could find himself suckered in by marginal weather and an inaccurate forecast, the mistakes that turned bad luck into tragedy are harder to understand. 
In the end, though, what matters is what we can learn. And this is a case with no shortage of lessons. The first and most obvious is that weather can be a deal breaker. And when conditions argue for a change of plans, safe pilots listen. Forecasts can be wrong, and it's particularly important to be wary when conditions are expected to improve. So this goes on because this is a training video, right? But if you have any experience in a small airplane, you're now afraid, right? There's no way you're not, right? Because you've just heard the voice of somebody who's not with us anymore. So the reason they have these videos is because not everybody is a brilliant pilot. So in this particular case, this, is, this guy would have loved to have had automation. He would have loved to have had that fuel management system that told him, you have five minutes of fuel left. Because then he would have known a long time before he wandered around that he needed to declare an emergency. He would have loved to have had an emergency flight planner that could have said, here's how much fuel you have left and here's how you get down. And guess what, you need to go to Dover because if you don't, you're gonna have to land off field. And if he had to land off field, and I'm looking over at him because that's his research, then he could have had more information with today's data than being in the dark, barely being able to see the trees. Because we have maps in digital form of terrain, of buildings, of roads, of power lines, all kinds of things. And these planes actually have a pretty good history of landing on those sorts of fixtures, golf courses. Now, here at night in the weather, you couldn't expect the human eye to see those options. But the computer can. And so this type of system would not just save the lives of people who are on big jets. It would save the lives of the individuals that are out flying in their Cessnas. And even smaller, if we have unmanned aircraft, it can prevent them from landing in populated areas. So there are a whole spectrum of applications that would have stopped US Airways 1549 from having to go in the Hudson River, and that also would allow guys like this to have the assistance that they need. Because the reality is that air traffic controller who was doing exactly what they should have done was not providing the advice that the guy needed. What he needed was the engineering. He needed, here's how much fuel you have and here's where you need to go. And here's when you need to go there. And that was not offered. And as you could see from his erratic flying at the end, right, he also was not being a good pilot because he was at that point mentally compromised because he realized at the end how desperate his situation was. So all of these things, I mean, if you watch enough of these videos, you see all kinds of situations, whether it's bad weather as a contributing factor, which was really the case here, or um, some kind of failure of a system as simple as a sensor. So I'm going to subject you to a few PowerPoints with apologies but not for very long. So we've kind of covered the what happened and not just in 1549, but also in at least one other case. And the reason that I wanted to show you that other case is because that other case is more common, right? It's very rare that a pilot really can save the day so spectacularly, along with some good equipment as what happened with US Airways 1549. Most planes who land in the water cartwheel. When they cartwheel, the amount of force placed on the occupants of the aircraft is very large. The plane tends to te tear apart and people die. When you land off field, you tend to land in things like trees, mountains, buildings, and that doesn't go very well either. Now there have been many cases where people have chosen wisely, but for every case where Harrison Ford lands in a golf course, there are five other cases where somebody hits the power lines on the way down or um, runs into a building or another car or something. So then uh, let's talk about pilots in the good and the bad. To some extent on the left, you see things that are good. And I stole this picture from Pedro, he'll recognize it. So the left are both loss of thrust instances where things happened 
pretty well. The top one we know. The bottom one is a case of a general aviation airplane in the New York City area that landed on the freeway. In that particular case, um, he was extremely lucky because he landed on the Cross Bronx Expressway. I don't know if you're familiar with that road, but it's very busy. But he landed at a construction zone. And there just happened to be people who could flag down traffic. <laughs> Figure the odds. Anyway, everybody was fine. Now, the ones on the right are not quite so fine. So one of the things that's raised by the questions uh, associated with those accidents are, um, how do we prevent bad behaviors on the part of pilots as well as trying to get autonomy to understand enough about the flight systems and have appropriate algorithms to help pilots who are trying to do good things? Well, so let's step back a little bit and ask the question, what is autonomy? And there's no one definition that everybody actually agrees upon, but let me throw this out. One of the things that happens in the conferences that I go to is there are arguments between automation and autonomy. What is your opinion? What's automation versus autonomy? And it can be biased by what you see here on the slide. I'm not going to read the slide. Anybody want to offer anything? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, what he said was automation is the simple tests, kind of the low level, calculate the fuel, put the controls in the right place to maintain level wings, that sort of thing. And then autonomy would be higher level decision making, the supervision layers of, of the automation. Uh, now, if you go to the dictionary, there's this really interesting definition on, of autonomy that says the quality of being self-governing. So I will read that bullet point. Now, what does that suggest? What that suggests is that an autonomous system doesn't always have to listen to its master. Right? So if you put this together with the last slide, there's some really interesting research questions that we're beginning to address in the automotive community and that also arise in aviation. And that is, what happens in cases where the human crew or single pilot and the decision-making software disagree. Right now, we assume that the human pilot or crew is right. There are always buttons to turn things off. And so you end up with situations where that's good because maybe the software has a bug and you want to turn it off. And then you also run into situations where that's bad, like those pictures that I showed you on the last slide. So what you really want is to have a better idea of how to decide in the software whether the software is right or wrong. Because if the software recognizes that it doesn't have a good answer, then certainly it would defer authority to whatever humans could help it. But on the other hand, if it recognizes an unsafe situation, in cases where the inputs are inappropriate, either because of a confused crew or a malicious crew, then the plane doesn't have to crash. So we have things about learning and so on. I think my points of here are just that you should have a lot of data that's available, but also machine learning is necessary. Humans do this as well. A human pilot is not just learning. In fact, learning is dangerous as a pilot. Why do I say that? The reason I say that is because if you have to learn, it means that you aren't certain of the outcome when you take an action. And so you want to mix the learning as needed into your process. But you sitting in the back of the next A320 that you take to San Francisco, you are not wanting the crew to learn on your flight. Let me tell you, right? You want them to follow the rules. You want the plane to work exactly as it's supposed to, and you want them to be bored out of their minds because every instrument is saying exactly what it should. That's a good day on an airplane. Same with the machines. Machine learning is cool. It's the big in thing for research right now. 
But the reality is if you have a database with rules, with data about the environment and the performance of the vehicle, and logic that has been validated and verified, you have a good day compared to needing to learn and having the unpredictability in the outcomes. Unfortunately, if you have rare or unmodeled events, which we have either as humans or software, then the learning is required. In which case, either you have the ability to do it or not. So one of the reasons, one of the tensions right now between having kind of automation at the level that it's at now and a higher level is what if something unexpected occurs? Is your auton autonomy or automation rigid? meaning that it's not going to be able to sense and react to the new situation. It's not going to recognize it. So there has to be that ability to do that. That's part of the challenge in the whole notion of, of collecting comprehensive data and exploiting that data to learn. There's also safety and trust. We trust people more. So we have these decision layers and there's lots of stuff and I'll share these slides. I'm going to go on to the discussion of how to solve the problem of US Airways 1549. So this uh, slide is about 13 years old. So I've seen this slide quite a lot over the years. Um, this is a really common sense, high level algorithm that deals with how do you plan for an emergency landing at a runway. So at the very top level, you have some kind of event. And this has system identification, but it could be so simple as, hey, your engines are off. And so then as soon as that happens, uh, you generate a footprint. A footprint uh, is where you can go. You're not going to be able to climb or maintain cruise flight for a long time. So you basically draw something that's very close to a circle around the aircraft on the ground and you say, if you can find a safe landing site in that near circle, then you can get there. So then the next step is to find the possible landing sites, in this case, just runways, and then to choose one. Well, if you're autonomy, not automation, then you have to rank them. You have to find whether they're long enough, wide enough, have favorable winds, all of those criteria that might be used also by crew but there's no reason the software can't also calculate the cost and benefit of landing a particular runway and then rank them. So there's this loop because if you don't have a good choice, you have to relax the constraints as much as you need to. This is what humans do that makes them end up on roads and golf courses as opposed to always on a runway. So the algorithm has to have that as well. But then there's also prioritizing the runways because you have to choose one. You can't go multiple places. So once you do that, you feed that runway to a traditional flight planner, many possible options. It could be something that's already on an airplane today, and it plans a trajectory. So in this case, we certainly know what happened. This was the original profile. Uh, so just for those of you that, that recognize this as MATLAB, Yes, it is. And it's plotted like this because these are the blue dots are the points from the cockpit black box. Right? So this is the data from that flight. Uh, and the reason they're so uh, spaced is because the black box data for GPS is only recorded once every four seconds. So even though the data is coming in faster, the black box does not record all of it. Yes? Um, <clears throat> Well, so the max altitude is just after the bird strike because they had some upward climb rates, right? So the deceleration would happen and then they would level off. Yeah, and you know, so the flight, they to climb, they to that? So those of you that took Arrow 201, answer his question. He asked, how did they manage to climb later in the flight? Well, so pilots, yes, very good. So airspeed for altitude, right? So I'm not plotting airspeed here, right? But the pilot did not maintain a best descent condition throughout the entire flight, right? So what that means is that they went from 
kind of going a little steeper. You can see that down, downward uh, um, trend before the, up, before the climb. So this was basically the pilot on the stick changing the trim state by moving the stick forward for that original dip and then back as a correction to say, wait a minute, I'm not at my ideal speed to glide as far as possible. So that's, that, that's why that looks like it is. And again, at the end, because uh, it's very important to have kind of the slowest speed that you can before you touch down in the water. So this is what happened. And the black square at the top um, was what I considered to be the fair starting point for the emergency flight planner. And that's being very conservative because the reality is probably the GPS point eight seconds ago, which would be two blue data points ago, was about when the actual event occurred. So that would have been eight extra seconds than what the planner had here. <clears throat> so that was time t equals zero. And so we, uh, so I ran the flight planner for time t that's marked there, t plus four, t plus eight, and t plus 12. So the first thing that happened is it drew the footprint and it found the runways within the footprint and then ranked them based on a utility function that included winds and lengths and so on. And here's what it came up with. Um, when all three, uh, when, th when at least three runways at LaGuardia were reachable, in this case, runway 31, which is the one they had taken off from, uh, and then runway 13 and runway 22, those are the headings that you face. So heading 310, which is nearly north, northwest, 13, which is southeast, and 22, which is uh, southwest. Um, so if you begin within the first four seconds after that black data point, you can actually get around and land into the wind. This is a very desirable thing because you don't have thrust reversers. The runway is not that long at LaGuardia. And so that gives you the ability to use the wind to your advantage to stop. If you wait another four seconds, you can't get back to 310 or 31 because you can't make that turn. So then you have to land at one of the other two, either runway 13 or 22. Um, I believe 13 was uh, longer. So yes, you have a tailwind, but it's a longer runway. And I guess a tailwind and a crosswind kind of trade off against each other. At least that's how it was in the utility function here. So if you wait another four seconds, runway 22 is the only thing that's reachable. Because if you can see, it has a slightly shorter path. So after those 12 seconds, you can't get anywhere, at least not on a runway. And Teterboro was a little farther away, so it was easier to get back to LaGuardia than it was to go to Teterboro. Right, so when you see the Sully movie and they had that option of Teterboro, they're starting before that black square, right? because it actually happened at least eight seconds before the black square. So the reason they had a case where they could get to Teterboro is that they were starting earlier. We don't have exact models of the airplane that's proprietary. So this is close. This is based on looking at the glide slope and the conditions that were in the black box data and then thinking about them being consistent with what we know about the A320. So this is not like super shocking new research, but the reason that this has been very popular over the years is because that's not in any airplane right now. Right? It's not in a manned airplane, it's not in a UAV. It might be in some military airplanes, but I don't know about them. Right? And, and why not? Because the biggest complaint that the research community had about this is that it was too simple. I, mean, I didn't have enough math. I mean, it's pretty easy to draw a footprint. It's pretty easy to look at a small runway database and prioritize things based on a cost function that's just a sum of weighted terms. So why is it not in there? Why do we not have that today? Well, I've asked people over the years, why do we not have this? Am I the only person who's ever thought of this? And of course the answer is no. People have thought of this, but it's new, it's new automation. And so to have this means that you have to upgrade legacy fleets of aircraft as well. So it's very hard to introduce a new technology. 
Because let's say that the Boeing 787 had this. What about the 737 or the 727 that just happens to still be flying? Well, the reality is, if the 787 has this and the 727 gets in an accident, lawyers come after Boeing. Maybe we'll get past that. Maybe we'll put some of this in. The same has been true of the auto companies, and now we're pushing past that because suddenly it became desirable to look competitive in this autonomous driving arena. So I'm pretty excited about that, not just because we're going to get driverless cars, hopefully, but also because it pushes back to the aviation industry this notion that you can have these kind of safety critical decision making capabilities augmenting the low level automation that has helped drivers and pilots for many years. So right now, this is uh, Pedro's research. We've been looking at new data sources, such as uh, street maps, um, so that you could fuse the onboard and the data together. Um, when you get to a helicopter or UAV, there's a question of, when you look around, is it safe? Right? There's a lot of research right now in choosing a safe landing site within range of a radar, LIDAR vision system that's mounted on the airplane. This is a nice flowchart that was in a paper. It's actually a journal paper written by undergrads. You may know some of them. Um, and uh, this is a really simple diagram that I consider to be the more recent equivalent of that yellow flowchart that I showed you before, which is something that probably won't get any respect because it's too easy. Here, there's this notion of asking the question, when you use all of your sensor data, can you find a safe place to land within range? And if the answer is yes, you use a sensor-based planner, which is looking within the coverage of your sensors and saying, OK, there is a good place. I'm going to land there. That's like a person looking out the window of their airplane and finding a field and going there and ditching the airplane, except with sensors. However, if the answer is no, if you have the ability to go beyond the range of your sensors, to look beyond the building that's occluding of sensor, then why would you just land somewhere unsafe that you could see or blindly drive in a particular direction not knowing what's there? The reality is, thanks to Google and others, GIS and so forth, we have maps of everywhere. So we actually do know what buildings, what terrain, what water features, what roads, what power lines happen to lie beyond sensor range. Let's use it. The reality is, for any sort of general aviation or small UAV that has a limited range in any particular flight, you don't even need a data link because you can load that data in a gigabyte drive on board and use it. It would fit in a tablet that you Velcroed to the control column of your plane. And so then, instead of wondering what you're going to see over the hill, you already know, which means that you can actually use this kind of emergency flight planning capability with a database-based planner that gives you a safe plan to land. So uh, Pedro here has done work with things like roads for emergency landing. So this is an example of uh, using uh, open street maps in New York, finding straight segments of roads that are not blocked by power lines, et cetera. Uh, and doing the same thing that you saw in that yellow flowchart, which is in the, here you have a marking of a triangle for the airplane, its footprint, and then you can see the road segments. And the reason that they're not symmetric is that you want to land the direction of traffic. Now, if you were to add something like cell phone data to that, not only would you know the direction of traffic from the map for the roads, you would also know how fast the traffic was going and how much traffic there was. So suddenly, it would not be a surprise to get to the road that was best, not only because it was long and straight, but because the traffic was actually going above the stall speed of your aircraft. And then your emergency landing can turn into a merge like we do every day on the freeway. So this is also Pedro's work. I warned him that I was going to show a few of his slides in looking at the use of cell phone data for other purposes, such as flying a small UAS, either in emergency or no normal situations, 
so that you minimize the flight over populated areas. So in this case, you have fuzzified data in Italy. The reason it's in Italy is because it's hard to find open cell phone data, and so this is data that he happened to find online. Uh, but what this allows you to do is basically a standard path planning approach where you basically go through the grids on your route that don't have high population densities, so you're minimizing overflight of people, and then when you choose a landing site, you can also choose a site that doesn't have many people. So this type of data, which is not universally available yet, but that will be, at least in this form, just like when you see Google Maps on your, on your phone, you see red segments of road and green segments of road and yellow segments of road because we know how fast the traffic is moving. The fact is, if we know that, we know a lot more that can give us this data as well. So this is uh, where I'll stop. Again, it turned into kind of a more research type of talk, but I'm already at 7.15, so I think uh, I'll, I'll stop now. Uh, there's a lot to be done in research to make situations like the US Airways flight not happen again, or if they do happen, to have them be a blip on the evening news that's not very remarkable. In the case of the US Airways flight, if they had had the software, we would never have heard of them because they would have gone back to LaGuardia. In the case of the video that I showed you, the guy would not have wandered around the Dover area trying to find a way to get in, in such that he could use his instruments and find the runway. Um, there are many other cases, and in general aviation and in small UAS, we're going to see them every day. We already do in the general aviation community, and we're going to have orders of magnitude more small UAS eventually than we have general aviation planes. So we need to put these kinds of capabilities in them. All right, thank you. Kelly Johnson, who is, uh, is, is obviously a hero of mine and of a lot of folks in, this, uh, in the industry. And um, it's, it's uh, somebody who uh, I think has inspired a lot of us.